Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining our discussion today about the Eight Keys to Safe Trauma Recovery Workbook. My name is Kevin Olson, and I'm the Associate Director of Norton Professional Books. I am very pleased to be introducing authors Babette Rothschild and Vanessa Baer, as well as Norton Professional Books Publishing Director, Deborah Malmud, who edited the new workbook. Babette is a longtime Norton author, beginning with The Body Remembers back in 2000. And just last week, we published an updated and expanded version of her 2006 classic, Help for the Helper, Preventing Compassion Fatigue and Vicarious Trauma in an Ever-Changing World. She is also the editor of the Eight Keys to Mental Health series, of which this workbook and its predecessor, Eight Keys to Save Trauma Recovery, published back in 2010. Uh, the workbook is both a companion to that first book, but also a standalone resource for, for both people interested in self-help and practitioners and their clients. Co-author Vanessa Baer is a psychotherapeutic counselor and well-being coach based in the UK. She integrates yoga, somatic trauma therapy, creativity, image work, relationship, and nature connection in her practice. This is her first book with W.W. Norton, and we're very pleased to welcome her to the Norton Publishing family. Uh, please leave your questions in the chat and we'll try to get to as many as we can before our time together ends today. So thank you again for joining us. And without further ado, I give you Babette, Ness, and Deborah in conversation. Thank Thanks, you so much, Kevin. Kevin. Really appreciate it. I'm so happy to be here with one of the authors with whom I've worked the longest in Babette, and one of the authors with, with whom I have worked the shortest in Ness. And I hope and know that with Ness, we're going to have an ongoing relationship, and that's awesome. And of course, Babette Goes Without Staying is a mainstay at Norton Professional Books for her seminal work on trauma and reaching out to multiple audiences, as well as her visionary leadership of the Eight Keys to Mental Health series and her editorship of that. Uh, she really does embody both an editor and an author. And I think of all the authors I have, I shouldn't say this, she could probably take over my job very effectively. <laughs> She's a wonderful editor, and I'm so happy to be here talking with both of them. So for the format, I will be asking some questions and letting the two of them discuss. I may chime in. I have a list of questions, so I'm going to start out that way, and then we'll see how things go. And as Kevin said, he'll be monitoring the chat. So if anything arises that you want us to expand on or move into, please put that in the chat, and Kevin will find a way to let me know. And if we can integrate that into the conversation, we'll certainly do that. So I want to start out by asking Ness, what um, in your mind is the main purpose of this workbook? Um, thanks, Deb. Um, the main aims of the workbook um, are really to help people who have experienced trauma increase their quality of life. Um, so that's to help them identify, assess and celebrate the resources they've already got. And also to offer others that they might find useful to add to their toolbox of recovery. And in the workbook, we offer some suggestions of uh, being equipped to cope, to focus on the present, to take control, as well as to recognize any remaining vibrations, such as flashbacks, as memories, rather than feeling as though they're experiencing the trauma again. And um, can you walk us through... Uh, Ness, can you sort of walk us through individually? We have this eight key format, which was something that uh, Babette probably suggested way back when as a manner of uh, presenting complex material to readers in a, not a simplified way, but in a digestible way. So can you walk through us what the eight keys are and then maybe have Babette sort of follow up in terms of expanding on those keys and uh, giving us some insight as to sort of how and why you you identified those. Yeah, that's a great idea. Okay, so um, in key one, um, key one is plotting your course with mindfulness. And that includes developing awareness of body sensations, of feelings and thoughts, and to use those skills to develop a mindful gauge, what we call a mindful gauge for making effective decisions. Um, which can help people for, to take back control in their lives. Um, we also explore here how to use extra sector awareness, which is our five senses, to feel grounded in the present. Uh, in key two, oh, do Wait, you want to go I just want to say I, um, I put that as the first key also in the um, original 
book that the workbook's a companion to, um, because I thought it was foundational to be able to gauge not only life, but also the book. So that um, readers are reminded every step of the way to use their own mindful awareness, their mindful gauge to make decisions about what they're going to read in the book, what exercises they're going to do, et cetera, as a way to start building up that empowerment of them knowing themselves and making decisions for themselves. Yeah. And I think at one point in the book, we say, you know, we have an exercise where people can look through the keys and choose which what which order they do it in. But we really recommend that key one goes first because of what Babette's just said as well. Yeah, I just wanted to chime in and say, I think as somebody who's worked on and edited a lot of various trauma books, one of the approaches that Babette has and has had is very empowering to the reader and to the 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 person who is experiencing the trauma and like acknowledging different ways of having that experience and therefore different ways of interacting with and um, applying interventions to that experience that I think is be, makes it very flexible for readers to engage with because you could be at various different stages of a recovery process and still get something out of the material as opposed to like, this is very programmatic. Great. Cool. So, oh, <laughs> so key two is begin with your echologue, which is an acknowledgement that the trauma's over and that you survived. Um, I guess I should put in the caveat that assuming that this is the case, like Deb said, people might be in different places. Um, but we do provide some caveats for those that are still experiencing the trauma as well. And that's, um, I think that's one of the main features of this book and also my philosophy and Nessa's philosophy is that in general, the trauma field I see is way too um, quick and anxious to get to processing trauma memories. Uh, from the beginning to the end, which can be really traumatic and sometimes very destabilizing for people. And so to slow that down and first just acknowledge, hey, I survived this, um, can be also very empowering and help facilitate dealing with other aspects of trauma recovery um, less traumatic. Yeah. So key three is called remembering is not required. And in this key, we focused on developing safety and stability um, and helping you uh, to decide if you wanted to process trauma memories or not, um, or with the knowledge that if you don't want to, you don't have to. And that's one way in which we sort of um, bust the common trauma therapy belief that everybody has to process their trauma memories in order to recover, which is absolutely untrue. The vast majority of the population of the world for thousands of years has survived trauma and recovered from trauma without processing their memories. Very useful for a lot of people, don't get me wrong, but um, uh, definitely not for everybody. And we wanted to get, make sure that uh, everybody knows that that's an option. I have a question actually for you both. It's totally uh, semi-personal and off topic, but a friend of mine had a relative who went through a very traumatic experience and she, it was her brother-in-law and she wanted to be supportive to him as he recovered from this horrible accident. But part of his process was talking about it a lot. And that conversation became very challenged. Those, those conversations became very challenging for her and she didn't want to hurt his feelings. And, you know, she said as best she could that it was a little bit much. I don't remember the language she told me she used, but I'm wondering if you have any thoughts for people on this call, maybe who are in a circumstance like that, that they want to be supportive to a loved one, uh, but that loved one in part of their recovery is processing a lot by talking with their friends and support system, but it's, it gets to be too much. What do you recommend in that circumstance? So you mean the, the content of what they're talking about becomes traumatic? 
for the right, like supported somebody who listener. Wanted- yeah, who's trying, you know, if you are if you are the support system for somebody who is processing something traumatic and as part of their processing, they like to talk about it a lot, but it becomes a lot for you. How do you handle right. that? I actually, um, I'll mention one other of my books, but in the Body Remembers casebook, I actually address this in a couple of the chapters, also in helping the um, the person who's been traumatized gauge and um, get support as uh, in the best possible way by talking with the people they're talking with about what they can manage and what they can't. And I like to say the devil's in the details. So the fact of talking about that a trauma has occurred, the fact of it is usually manageable for most people, but where um, a lot of people get into trouble, both um, as as the person who was traumatized and the person who's listening, whether they're a friend or a professional, is how much detail is involved. Because the more detailed, the more traumatic it can be to listen. And so if this is my friend, I might say something to the effect of, I want to be there for you. I want to listen to you. And let's do this together. Let's negotiate so that it's best for both of us, so that I can be here to the maximum you need without um, feeling like I'm vulnerable to what they call vicarious trauma. So if you can talk more about how the trauma affects you and less about the actual details about what happened, that would be easier for me to support you because then also I'd have some guideline for where to go to support you because I would know more how it's actually affecting you. Mm -hmm. I think as well, it might be useful for them to check in with their friend as to whether this talking about the details is actually helpful for them or not or whether actually their friend comes away from those conversations feeling worse or better after doing that just to draw some kind of conscious awareness of whether it's actually useful for Mm -hmm. them to do that or whether some kind of contact and support in another way would be better for them and then I was also thinking about how many strategies there are in help for the helper that would be absolutely great Um, in helping that person to create some separation from what's happening for them. It's also very helpful, for example, and I write write about that in Help for the Helper, that if you're listening to someone's trauma story and they are talking about details, don't picture it in your mind's eye. Don't try to feel it in your own body. Turn off the empathy. Just be there with your compassion and your love and your caring and listen without trying to relate or resonate with their experience and that will make it much easier on the listener professional or non-professional thank you for that and sorry sorry to derail but um it's a great question related to your point three and i will i will relate all of this to my friend cool so uh key four is stop flashbacks um with flashbacks being a common symptom of trauma and one that really has a strong negative effect on quality of life um, this key focus is purely on practical ways to stop flashbacks. And that's extremely empowering. Um, there is a misnomer both among those who are traumatized and among a lot of therapists that flashbacks help people process their trauma memories and they actually don't. Um, there's a saying in neuroscience that neurons that fire together wire together. And the more someone has a flashback, actually the more hardwired the memory of that trauma gets in their brain and it makes it that much more difficult to um, interrupt that process and uh, disconnect uh, uh, that, that process from the person's daily life and let the trauma rest in the past in their memories where it belongs. Could you give us an example, perhaps, of a strategy that you present in the book that would deal with this issue? Because I I imagine this is a common one for people. Um, Dealing with um, helping the person anchor in the present moment. We're stopping a flashback, yeah. Mm -hmm. We're stopping a flashback. Mm -hmm. Because what a flashback is, is it hijacks your attention from the present moment into your past. Okay? It's like a hijack. It, like, captures you. And makes you feel like the past is happening. And when you anchor in the present moment, turn on your five senses, what 
what's called extroceptors, your sight, your hearing, your touch, your taste, your smell, and touch includes just even feeling the temperature in the room. That's your skin, that sense of touch. Um, anchoring in the present moment using extroceptors helps anchor your awareness, your attention now, and separate now from then. And that's a key factor in helping stop a flashback. And the other really key factor is acknowledging it's a memory, even though we use the terminology um, reliving or re-experiencing, not possible. It's in the past. So what people call reliving or re-experiencing is actually memory. It's actually remembering. And I think it's much more helpful to call it that because it also um, uh, uh, reduces the horror of it. Like I'm not re-experiencing it. Oh my God. Oh, I'm remembering it. Oh, that's remembering that. Like I remember dinner last night. Well, actually sort of the same, even though what they're remembering when it's trauma is something really horrific. Somebody's posted a question in the chat says, I have a client who reports smelling the place he experienced trauma. Do you have any guidance about this? Um, I would say, first of all, to acknowledge that he's not smelling the place, he's remembering the smell of the place. That's absolutely key. And then get something. Right now I have ginger tea. Get something uh, to smell in present moment to remind you, okay, now I'm smelling ginger. So that other smell, that's remembering what happened. And now I'm smelling ginger. And you can do that or, or go to the kitchen and open a jar of cinnamon or a perfume or a flower or, you know, whatever to remind yourself, this is now, that was then. That's a great, very helpful. Thank you. And I guess just while we're on that subject where I guess a therapist asked that question, that therapists remember to use past tense as well when referring to memories. So the difference between, you know, what can you see when you remember this or instead of, but rather what, what did you, what did you see or what do you remember seeing? Yeah. Right. A lot of times people say, um, especially if they're in a flashback, I'm seeing the tsunami or I'm seeing the perpetrator and to stop them and say, wait, in this room, do you see a perpetrator in this room or the tsunami in this room? So what you're calling seeing is actually remembering what you saw. And some languages don't have past tense. A lot of Asian languages don't have tenses. So you have to use language to, to further embellish that and that, and that helps with clients too. You're not remembering that something, you're not seeing something that's happening now. You're remembering that something that happened in the past. As long as we're in the chat, I'm gonna pose this other question from somebody. Uh, somebody writes, oops, wait a minute, just went away. That there are somatic techniques and perhaps nature-based methods for people to use to get in touch with the body experience of trauma. I'm an art therapist and somatic experiencing practitioner. So I'm excited about this workbook. Will you be describing these components? Bonus. Yeah, <laughs> I guess is the short answer. I mean, we've tried to, uh, I, there is so, as we've already touched on, it's such an individual process, the recovery from trauma. And so we've tried to um, match that with diverse um, activities and exercises throughout the book so that we know that there's no sort of one fits all approach to trauma. And um, so instead we've cast the net quite wide to appeal to um, hopefully uh, some things will appeal to everybody. And I'd like to say it just among the many things that Ness has brought to this project is uh, um, uh, a lot of talent and um, experience in connecting with nature in terms of trauma healing. That's one of her many specialties and talents. And I'll just do a, a quick plug to say that she has more coming in that area with Norton Professional <laughs> Books that we're very excited about. But we'll just leave it at that for the moment. Um, yeah, watch your emails. 
Yeah, watch your email for that. Um, also in the chat, back to the uh, the flashback question, somebody has written that they experience flooding related to flashbacks, that one flashback or trigger in the present moment can cause a cascade of other memories. Would you recommend dealing with flooding the same as flashbacks? Or if not, are there some other recommendations that you have? Absolutely. Present moment anchoring. Use your extraceptors. I'm remembering this flood of horrible stuff at the same time that I'll say for myself, I'm sitting in my living room, looking at the computer screen, tasting my ginger tea, tasting and smelling my ginger tea on my skin. I can feel it's a little cool in the room. Um, I feel the firm chair under my bum. Um, and I can see out the window that it's a, another sunny day in Southern <laughs> California. And um, I just heard Deborah laugh. It's sunny here in New York too, so. <laughs> it's very nighttime here. It's completely <laughs> black outside. I mean, we, 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 we are gonna be getting some serious weather when we've had some, but it's beautiful today. Nice. Um, okay, so thank you for that on the flooding. So I think we are up to point key five, if I'm, my notes are correct. That's right. And key five is split into two, which is 5A is forgive your limitations and 5B is share your shame. So in 5A, we explore the limitations that people have during the traumatic event. And 5B aims to help people resolve any feelings of shame. One of the um, often mentioned um, features of the original eight keys to safe trauma recovery is that fifth chapter on shame and forgiveness. And because just about everybody who continues to suffer from trauma has some kind of internal um, disruption with regard to shame. And, um, and so it's actually quite key to pay attention to at, at some points along the way in, in recovery, um, primarily self-forgiveness and then um, helping heal shame, which is quite different than healing other, other emotions. Um, yeah. Do you think that the process of trauma recovery, particularly with regard to these two points, can be uh, protective, say, in cases where there might be a future trauma. Like, for example, what I mean is if you've sort of successfully or effectively forgiven yourself and overcome shame, like in the future, if you experience some type of trauma, would you be more well equipped? Or is it sort of connected to a specific trauma? Like, to what extent does this key or any of the keys really prepare? you as a human being for a future uh, adverse effect or impact of trauma? I would say that increasing your resources, um, effectiveness in uh, managing stress and trauma, um, developing and nurturing um, a good relationship with yourself can only empower you for um, managing whatever diversity comes in the future. That doesn't mean you can't get the rug still pulled out from under you, but that you will also have, you also know that in your toolbox, you have tools for dealing at least partially with that, if not totally. Yeah. And I think in this key as well, we discuss, um, the sort of mechanics of the response of the trauma response. And I think having um, a greater self-understanding of, of why that is can, can really help as well, help to find that self-compassion sooner so that it doesn't, so that that kind of um, self-doubt or self-shame isn't a prolonged experience, yeah. Okay. Thank you. So we're moving on to key six. That's right. So key six is take smaller steps for bigger leaps. And this um, 
this key is about going back to our feeling that safety is paramount and it's all about going slow and steady and avoiding re-traumatization. And I guess I should say as well that the concept of this is applied throughout the book as well. So this is kind of the, it's concentrated in this key, but our, our sort of um, approach, this approach is throughout the book too. One of the red threads of um, people who come to me for supervision and consultation is a client who isn't doing this, that, or the other, or they're um, uh, not managing well, but and not able to meet goals and whatever. And, and almost invariably, it's because the the bite or the step that they're trying to take is just too big. Um, uh, better to take uh, what might seem like a ridiculously tiny step that can be successfully managed and build on that than to try a step that's too big. One of the examples I give is if I'm sitting at the table here and I want to get to my front door, which is, you know, about 12 feet away from me, if I try to do it in one step, I'm going to hurt myself. Even if I try to do it in two or three steps, I'm going to hurt myself. But if I get up and I just go an inch at a time, which might seem very silly, I'm going to get there. And I'm going to get there without hurting myself. So, um, uh, so, and usually things fall somewhere between the ridiculously small and the ridiculously big. But getting the idea of if something seems unattainable, it's probably because you're trying to do too much at once. I have a question about uh, along these lines that um, sometimes people, if they were, if they're experiencing trauma and uh, trying to do exactly this, what you're saying, it feels out of the norm of the way they live the rest of their life. They may be very, you know, easily walking through life in, in a professional way or an intellectual way or in a relationship way or whatever, uh, but not being able to bring that self to the recovery process. And so how would you, how would you, um, aid a client or someone coming to you for supervision with a client like that, who says like, well, that's not who I am. You know, I'm not, the, I'm not the inch taking step person. Um, so how do I reconcile that with, with the rest of my life? So I might say, so when you, you can you swim? When you learned to swim, did you start out in the deep end? Did, you know, did you just jump immediately into the deep end or did you start in the shallow end and learn to kick and hold your breath and blow bubbles? So maybe all of you isn't only that, you know, maybe a part of you really does know about, you know, taking smaller steps. Can you think of anything in your, your daily life or in your, your, the kind of work that you do where actually you do have to break things down into smaller steps to be able to accomplish? I think one of the other things that we explore here as well is like, um, I think there's a common, well, as I hear quite a lot of people saying, oh, you shouldn't, you should never avoid anything. You have to attack it straight on. And so that's something as well that we explore in this chapter about actually how avoidance can be an absolutely fantastic, fantastic thing that we actively encourage. Um, yeah, <laughs> so that's, something else that we explore in the book as well as to identify things that are just too difficult for the moment and what mm -hmm. alternatives might be. I like to say I'm a big fan of avoidance um, because it means I'm not ready. I don't feel like I have the tools for it. Um, I'm too frightened right now. You have to translate it. Um, and respect it. There's a lot of old school wisdom that in the trauma world and in a lot of psychotherapy, we've forgotten a, a book I want to talk to you about sometime, Deborah, old school wisdom. And an old school wisdom is respect the defense. And we've totally forgotten about that. Um, but that's a basic old school wisdom is if there's a defense, respect it. It's a way of coping. We will have that conversation. Okay. <laughs> All right. I think that brings us to step eight key eight uh it's key seven oh which sorry. is it's okay uh get moving 
which is an uh, antidote to the freeze response when we move. It gives, um, in that key, we give practical exercises for getting up and about, for dissipating stress, increasing containment, control, and muscle tone. And one of the things that a lot of people don't know is increasing muscle tone, actually the strength and, and tone in the muscles can be very helpful in, um, in allowing people to better contain stress as well as excitement. Um, we're usually trying to relax all the time, which means loosening muscles. And for a lot of people with trauma, um, anxiety and panic, that actually um, is counterproductive. There's a, a phenomenon called, um, now let me see if I, Ness help me. Um, Relaxation induced anxiety. Yes, say it again. Relaxation induced anxiety. And that means that some people, when they try to relax, they get more anxious. And that looks to be, I don't have statistics on it, but it looks to be primarily people with trauma, panic and anxiety um, disorders. And, um, and those people, if you help them tone up, um, oftentimes they do much better rather than trying to relax, even before they go to bed. If rather than trying to relax, they do some things to help build a, a little bit of muscle tension in their body, oftentimes they're better able to contain and manage even to sleep, which is sort of counterintuitive. Hmm. All right, last chapter. Yeah. Um, so the final key is key eight, which is make lemonade. And that's all about finding meaning in experience and turning adversity into advantage. As demonstrated by these two authors who both Ness and I have our own trauma backgrounds and in part, we've made lemonade with that by taking what we've learned um, and turning that into written words to, to help others. But there's plenty of other ways to do that. Even taking helping your neighbor by taking out their garbage can be making lemonade. I'm wondering how would you, what advice would you have for therapists to actually use this book and the materials in this book with clients, like actually um, use it in a clinical way? Can you, can you speak to that, what you would recommend on that point? We're big fans of partnership. And um, so I would talk about it with the client and use the, the concept of the mindful gauge also to, um, uh, to negotiate together and go at a pace and a topic or a task that the client feels ready for um, and um, do, do this as a partnership together. Go ahead, Ness. I guess I was also thinking that um, some therapists have told us that they intend to use the workbook as kind of a homework support um, one of the things that Babette talks about in training courses is that there's 168 hours in a week and most clients only have one hour a week with their therapist and this book, the workbook can offer a support system in between. Um, you mentioned the mindful gauge um, a, a now and a couple of times. Can you do a demonstration of this or get more into what you're talking about there? Sure. Ness, you want to do that with me? Yeah. So um, this would just be like a very basic, like sort of training exercise in, in, in um, loyalty to the small steps I did. You don't want to start out with, with something difficult. But um, what you want to do is, is first find out what your best gauge, your own best gauges are. And um, the ones I've identified or we've identified, and it, it doesn't mean they're the only possibilities, but these are the ones we've identified. You might think of others are um, uh, what you feel in your body, what you think, um, any images you might get in your mind, any impulses you might have for moving, um, 
Oh, anything you might be feeling emotionally. Um, so Ness, using those, tell me something you might like to make a decision about today, something simple. It can even be like what you have for dinner. Yeah, okay, so I'm gonna choose what I'm gonna have for dinner and I'm gonna choose between soup or a stir fry. Okay, okay. so in turn, imagine eating each one and maybe also imagine how you feel after you've eaten them. Okay. And notice anything that you're aware of in your body, any images you have, any impulses you have for moving, um, anything you feel emotionally, any thoughts you have. Yeah. So focusing on the soup, I feel like a warmth in my mouth and in my throat that comes all the way down to my belly. Um, and kind of a soothing feeling in those same places as well, like warm and soft and soothing feeling. And, and when you think about the stir fry, what are you aware of? Mm, I kind of have a, like a warm sensation actually in my mouth, but it doesn't, it doesn't continue all the way down in the same kind of soothing, warm way. Okay. Is that sort of normal for you when you focus on like a decision or something that you go first to your body sensations? Yeah. Okay. So is that sort of already, you know, that's a reliable gauge for you? Yeah. It's not necessarily that I have that sensation, but it's definitely that I, I notice sen different sensations in my body. Okay. So based on that, well, let's, let's try one other thing, because I did this actually um, last night to decide what I was going to have for dinner. I had a choice between three things, and I stood in front of my kitchen sink. And first, I took two of them and imagined one on my right and one on my left. And I waited, and I waited to see what happened as I turned my head, like which direction my head wanted to turn toward. Yeah. And then once I decided on one of those, I took that one and the other third one and did it again nice. to be able to decide what I was going to have. Try that. Okay. With the same thing with soup and stir fry or with something? Yeah. Different? Okay. So I'll close my eyes. And put one on one side and one on the other and see where your, your head gravitates toward. <laughs> definitely gravitates towards soup yeah okay. yeah yeah okay yeah so this is just two possible gauges you can play what I would say to my client is you can play with them for other things you're deciding throughout the day what am I going to wear what am I going to have for a snack what am I going to watch on tv and just practice and find out for you for particularly for Ness it's quite clear that body awareness uh, sensations and such um, are very re reliable and powerful gauges for her, but everybody's different. I I talk in the um, the original A Keeps the Safe Trauma Recovery about somebody who get a image of a rabbit in her head when she was and when it was something good for her, the, she the the image she'd see in her head would be a happy rabbit, and if it wasn't, it would be a sad or an angry rabbit or the rabbit would disappear altogether. And that was the gauge she came to rely on so steadily. So it can be all sorts of things. Thank you, that was helpful. Um, also, uh, Ness, did you want to demonstrate uh, balancing objects? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. So um, it, this uh, balancing takes place in both keys three and key seven. So it can be good for sort of feeling stable and it, uh, ironically, seeing it, balancing can be quite chaotic and, um, and also for the get moving. And I guess by chaotic is, I mean that um, uh, like th things are wobbling around. That's sort of what I mean, really. Um, so the I, reason I'd, like, I'd like to add that it also helps people anchor in present moment because you yeah. can't do the balancing without paying attention to now. 
Yeah. Whether you're balancing on one foot or whether you're balancing an object, you have to be present to be able to do it. Yeah. And um, improving balance as well can bring a sense of mastery um, and uh, focus. Um, that can be a really great distraction from like difficult feelings and emotions as well. So all of those things. Um, yeah. So in the balancing objects um, exercise, we're not trying to become like expert balancers. The point of it isn't to be able to be the best balancer in the world. The point of it really is to be able to stay focused, stay present and stay aware um, and to as well notice whether you, it, you're you feeling better or you're feeling worse. Um, if you feel too, if you're finding the challenge too difficult, it's really important that you reduce the challenge. So you find whatever the balance challenge just helps you stay focused and aware, but doesn't send you to that point where you want to throw whatever you're balancing out of the window. <laughs> right. Uh, paying attention to maybe it needs to be a smaller step. Yeah, or exactly. a smaller step or even a smaller step. Yeah. So to start with, Babette, do you have a pen or a pencil near you? Excellent. Well prepared. So um, Deborah, then, Deborah could do this too. Yeah, Deborah, John, and anybody else that's on the webinar, that would be great. I chose a pink one, then it shows up. So to start with, you might want to actually an easy way place to start is to get two fingers and to see about balancing the pencil on two fingers. It's hard or to do it on easy. camera. It's easier to do it lower down. <laughs> yeah. Or even if that's tricky, you could try on the palm of your hand to start with. So. And that's a really good example of smaller steps. Yeah. So if one finger is too hard, then try two. Yeah. You can try three or even just your whole palm. Your whole palm. Yeah, absolutely. The point is to be successful. Yeah, exactly. But focus. So it's finding that feeling of success, but also the feeling of focus and awareness, because if it's too easy as well, then it might not keep your focus and awareness at the same time. Part of the place where I learned this is at school when um, I found it difficult to concentrate at school and I started balancing things on this myself to stay um, to pay attention. So for me, I'm doing two fingers and you might want to move to one finger switch your finger see whether it's uh enough challenge and if that you're finding that too easy if you're finding it a challenge then step back if you're finding it too simple and it's hard to keep your focus you might want to have a go at moving your finger around so maybe draw a circle great yeah and then you might want to lift it up above your head if that's getting too easy <laughs> and then bringing it back down yeah but that it looks like you need maybe a bit more challenge so that might be swapping from one finger to another sometimes we have kind of not as strong vestibular on the other side so try circle on the other side well, I'm cheating because I've practiced this before. <laughs> okay. And then if that's getting even easier, still, you might do all sorts of things like stand up and walk around with it. You might decide to balance two objects on top of each other. So, for example, I have some building blocks here. And um, Babette, what have you got there? I've got a spoon. I don't know if I can do this. I haven't practiced this one. Okay. okay. And I've got two like building bricks here and I'm going to see if I can balance one. Oh, there I did it. Oh, oh what have you got there, Deb? I'm in one of my kids' rooms. Oh, cool. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what it is. Excellent. <laughs> yeah, so it's all about kind of gauging the level of challenge that keeps you really focused and aware, but not too much that you want to throw the building blocks out of the window. So really being aware of what's right for you. So that's the kind of uh, other thing that it helps with as well, is it helps you to stay aware of, um, yeah, what's right for you. And in the book, we talk about the story of Goldilocks, where Goldilocks goes into the house of the three bears and she sits down and she finds uh, some porridge and she sees the porridge is too hot. Ooh. And she, then she finds another bowl of porridge and it's too cold. And then she finds a third and it's just right. 
And throughout the book, we really encourage you to notice what's just right for you to be Goldilocks. Yeah. And um, sort of applying that to every exercise can be really useful. Yeah. Cultivate sort of your thought, inner Goldilocks. Yeah. Uh, this kind of concept uh, tailors into a comment slash question we received in the chat, which is that um, how might the keys vary for different types of trauma? Because trauma is a very broad concept. <clears throat> Uh, from living long-term chronic damaging situation to a one-off traumatic incident, like how how do the the eight keys kind of vary for that, or would deal with um, the fact that trauma itself is can be lots of different things. Um, uh, trauma can be lots of different things, and the 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 thrust of the the eight keys to safe trauma recovery and the eight keys to safe trauma recovery workbook are both with regard to helping reduce the effect that trauma is having on the person so that they can recover from it. And recovering from trauma is possible whether or not you ever pay attention to the actual trauma that happened, but you have to pay attention to how it's affecting you now. And so, um, uh, so these eight keys are specifically for how it's affecting the person now. And in that way, it doesn't really matter what the, what the trauma was in the past. But if um, uh, the person's uh, having trouble, for example, with flashbacks, it doesn't matter what the flashbacks are about, the managing and taking control of and being empowered to stop a flashback is the basics of that are the same. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And to, I guess, reiterate what Babette said before is that we don't explore trauma memories in any of the in any of the exercises. Um, we all the exercises have been chosen to try and avoid as much as possible any re-traumatization or destabilization. Um, they would all fit into phase one, the goal being safety and stabilization, or phase three with the intention of integrating safety, integrating the safety and stabilization into everyday life. So we do have composite cases, but we've been very careful to keep out details. As we were talking before, the details are where um, the reader could get would be more more vulnerable to get traumatized. So we've left out details, although we've talked about people who have experienced a this, that or the other without the details of that experience. Uh, we got another question in the chat. How are flashbacks different from intrusive images like we see with people with OCD? Um, I think the only difference for me would be that I might not call it. It depends on what the intrusive image is, whether I would call it a memory or not. But the process of being able to stop it by paying attention to present moment extraceptors, et cetera, um, that would certainly be one strategy. For I guess I, I would ask uh, a question of what you think, Babette, but um, flashbacks as well can, as far as I'm aware, create the same bodily responses and the same, like the same chemical releases as happened in the traumatic experience which I'm not sure whether would necessarily happen in intrusive images. It depends on what they are and what they're connected yeah. to, yeah. Yeah. They might be trauma flashbacks. There was a comment back to the gauging. Somebody was writing that when they are gauging a decision that is more complex and has trauma-related triggers within it, that they become blocked and that becomes challenging. So I'm wondering if you have any suggestions for that viewer on that point. Um, I might take a look at what the decision is first and see if the decision actually involves multiple decisions. Hmm. Uh, when Because uh, it was described as complex. And if, that, if it's possible to separate out the, the um, the multitude of decisions and approach each one separately at first before putting them all together, that might, might make it uh, more manageable. Um, uh, 
And otherwise, I'm not sure, maybe Ness can say more, but without knowing more about it, which we don't have time for today, um, I'd be afraid, I think, to give more guideline about that. Yeah, I think the only thing I'd say about the separating out is as well, start with the easiest. Mm -hmm. The one that's the least activating as well. Yeah. Yeah. So um, in the closing minutes, I wanted to just step away from the content of the book itself to ask, um, I guess, starting with Babette really, and just tell you that when um, I'm going to ask about your collaboration a bit, when you, Babette, uh, reached out to me and said, oh, I have, I want to work with somebody as an editor, like my heart sank because just <laughs> telling the world here, we don't really like co-editors, co-authors. <laughs> it's hard to deal with two people. Often it doesn't work out. It's been a lovely experience with the two of you. And indeed, I'm so excited to continue uh, my separate relationship with Ness moving forward and hopefully something more from the two of you. But I'm wondering if you could it's share- It's in the works. <laughs> Great. Um, I'm wondering if you could share with our uh, people on the call here, uh, Babette, maybe how the two of you came to, uh, to know each other, to undertake this project together, uh, because not only was it something that you're writing together, but um, related to a book that had already been written by you, Babette, alone. So I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about that for those, um, those moments here, and then maybe have Ness chime in from her perspective being brought in um, in this manner. Okay. Yeah. And I remember that we, you know, we've talked about that before. I knew that I approached you with a bit of trepidation. Um, about a collaboration, but um, Ness had been a student on one of my longer 12-day trainings. And since those are limited to 24 people, I gotten to know her fairly well. She also started assisting on courses with me. And I've wanted for a long time to do this workbook. And where I know I have strengths in the theory area, I also know that I um, am not as strong in the um, exercises and creating tasks area. And I um, I had been um, signing on to um, Ness's Instagram, which I think is wild and well-being, isn't it, Ness? And um, with things that she wrote and stuff, I could see that she had strength in that area. So I also went and looked at her website and then I started talking with her about it. Did she have any articles? And I didn't tell her why I was asking this stuff. Better and reel them in without them knowing. Yeah, yeah. And then when I realized she had talents in these areas, I said, what do you think? Do you think we could do this? Would you be interested? And, um, and then before I, I wanted to do any, I think I told you that I was thinking in this direction, Deborah. but before we came with anything formal to you, I wanted to make sure we could work together. So we wrote our proposal and two full chapters together before I was willing to go to you to see if you would be interested to um, contract the book because I wanted to make sure that we actually could work together doing this. And, um, uh, and the rest is history. And we've got another workbook in, in the works for the help for the helper. Absolutely. Yes, go ahead. Anything you want to want to say about it. And anyway, and I would like to say that I'm just thrilled that you said yes, Ness. And Me too. I've, I've just been delighted um, with how we have worked together. What a great partner you've been in this. Yeah. And um, and that's not to say that Ness isn't strong on theory. You can hear that from the things she's contributed today. But um, uh but that wasn't first and foremost in my mind when I asked you to join us. She also has a lot of um, talents in the area of art and help format the book and, you know, et cetera. Go ahead, Miss. Um, I guess I was going to share about how, um, uh, how amazing it was really to be, <laughs> to be asked to do that. So it was um, both uh, exciting and flattering and terrifying. All, all at once, I think. Um, one of the big things for me was that um, the eight, the original Eight Keys book had been such an amazing support for me personally as well. And I think I share a bit of that in the book. Um, 
So it was even more kind of poignant for me to work on this as well, because it was, it was so, it was such an important book for me. Um, and a, a really key chapter for me was the forgive your limitations, the idea, the concept of self-forgiveness. And I think whereby I think a lot of things talk about for, focus on the forgiving of others. And it was this permission to forgive myself was key for me. Um, but I guess also, as you can hear from Babette, she's such a fantastic advocate for other people, such a encouraging and um, oh, so giving with um, your advice and very generous with um, sort of including and advocating other people. And I think it's fantastic. So I really appreciate that 100%. And Deborah, your input has been absolutely amazing as well. So, yeah, really. Well, thank you. It's been it's been great working with both of you. And um, as you've mentioned, the Help for the Helper book and the forthcoming workbook from the two of you, Help for the Helper revision, I, or second edition revision, is just out uh, from Norton and has amazing updates and um, more from Babette. So I would suggest anyone on this call who is a therapist or any type of helping professional, check that out and be on the lookout for a workbook from Babette and Ness on Help for the Helper as well, as well as, of course, this book, The Eight Keys to Safe Trauma Recovery Workbook. And I really want to, before I just turn it over to Kevin at the end for a moment, thank you both so much for collaborating so wonderfully together. It was really great to work on the manuscript. And I found so much within the book of both of your voices coming together in a way that also was very unified and can be challenging for a book written by two people. But in this case, it worked super well. And I just want to thank you both for delivering such a great manuscript and for helping us publish such a lovely book that we're really excited to continue to get to readers. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Kevin for some closing Wait, remarks. I just, yeah, I want to say, I want to say um, a big, I don't get to do this public very often. A huge thank you to Deborah for being like the best editor in the world and friend for going on 23 years now. And um, it's just been a huge plus in my life. And Kevin, you've been helping get the books out there and collaboration with you all these years. Um, I really give you both so much thanks. And Ness, thank you for saying yes, because it's been a great experience and we have so much more to do. Thank you, Babette. That's um, so super generous of you. And um, I'll just share one other thing, as you know, as you know it, others don't. Um, I inherited you as an author from my predecessor, like right away, I think very close to when I began your actual first editor left. And it was um, also one of those things as an editor, just some behind the scenes publishing. When you inherit an author, you're kind of like, always a little nervous because you never know what you're going to get. And I got a gem. So thank you, Babette. It's been awesome over the years to know you in all the ways that I do. And um, as I said at the outset, to uh, continue to work with Ness in the future. So I'm super excited about that. And now over to Kevin. Deborah, thank you so much. Babette, thank you for the kind words. Ness, it's been wonderful working with you. Looking forward to doing more of that work with, with all of you. Uh, in, in both the very immediate and, and near future. Um, thank you all for taking the time to do this. I want to thank everyone that registered and, and participated, and thank you for your great questions. We're going to be sending a recording of, of, of this talk to all of our registrants. We'll also be sharing it um, on our social media network. So if you look in the chat, you'll see some of the links to the Norton Mental Health social outlets. Um, there's also um, Babette's uh, website and Ness's Instagram uh, handle if you want to reach out to them directly. Some people had, had mentioned they wanted to, to reach out to, to both of you to ask you some questions that they didn't get a chance to ask during this talk. So, so please contact those folks there. And uh, Can I put my email in the, in the chat and they're welcome to contact me? Absolutely, absolutely. And 
I bet if that doesn't post publicly, it's I have. Oh yeah, it won't. So yeah, if you can. Oh wait a minute. Let's see. Yeah, you have to do that for me, Meredith, if you would. And for Ness also. We got it out there. Yeah. We got it. <laughs> thank you, Natalie, who's behind the scenes, having all this run smoothly for all of us. So thank you, Natalie Argentina, our marketing publicity assistant, who, who also made this possible and, it, it, and is, is posting many things in the in the chat as well for everyone. So thank you all again. Um, enjoy the rest of your day. And we hope to interact with you in person or on, or on Zoom again in the near future. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.